from the World Health Organization and from scientists in China. Xi Jinping is now working overtime, even drafting scientists with PhDs to work on the assembly line. That's how much demand there is right now. Yes, yes, crazy demand. Not, not only from the domestic market, but also, you know, from the overseas market. The demand is urgent because identifying coronavirus is one of the best ways to stop the spread of this disease. We don't know what the future holds. I think just about everyone knows that this will come to an end at some point. It will certainly come to an end when there is an effective vaccine. With so many people being told to shelter in place, the economy in a tizzy, there's a worldwide race for a vaccine and or cure, but how fast and when, when will that happen? The World Health Organization says a vaccine for coronavirus could take 12 to 18 months to develop and test. We're all, of course, looking for a sign of hope in the global coronavirus pandemic. Scientists in Germany are actually running some tests. Experts believe developing a viable vaccine will take at least a year and potentially even longer. A Frederick Python has more. CureVac is, is a fairly small German lab company that uh, that makes vaccines. They very early on felt that they were pretty far along in trying to map the DNA of the uh, coronavirus and then try and find a way to create a vaccine. These scientists in Germany, like countless others around the world, are in a race against time, trying to develop a vaccine as fast as possible for an illness the scientific world has a lot to learn about. And while we were there, we kept getting messages about large trade fairs in Germany being closed because of the coronavirus, you know, uh, concerts being canceled, the German soccer league being, and it was all coming in by the minute. And every time, you know, they realized that the world was looking to them to try and find some sort of way of mitigating this crisis to make sure that we could continue to live or, or we could go back to living our lives the way that they were. Each of these little tubes contains a different construct of the virus's code. Right now, the scientists at the main lab in Germany are trying to find out which one is the safest and most effective to be turned into a vaccine. They were quite confident in their method. They were definitely working at a hard pace. There you could really feel how these researchers there realized how important their work was, realized that they were on the forefront of trying to fight this gigantic pandemic uh, that has gripped the world. The pressure couldn't be higher, with the number of novel coronavirus cases jumping every day and the global economy taking a beating from the coronavirus's effects. The company says it's working overtime to get it done soon. I think being in there definitely made us uh, more optimistic that you know we have extremely competent scientists who are at a stage of understanding the virus or beginning to understand the virus in a way that they can try and develop things that will then combat the, uh, effectively. I think one of the great legacies of this is going to be uh, a, a reminder of those who acted quickly and those who did not. For those who acted quickly, uh, I think it's going to be tangible in terms of the number of lives that they um, prevented from getting ill or dying. Hundreds of people around the world are coming to their balconies, opening their windows and doors, applauding healthcare workers who are on the front lines, of course, of fighting this outbreak. Last night, people in Buenos Aires showed their appreciation, look at this, applauding doctors and healthcare workers from their balconies. That was over the weekend. New Yorkers stood out on rainy balconies to applaud medical workers. Outside my building here and throughout New York, I'm sure throughout the world as well, every, every night at 7 p.m. people come out onto their balconies and clap for uh, the healthcare workers. It is a tiny thing that we can do to identify and to, and to, 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 to say to them that, that, that we recognize the, the risks that they are taking. As people across Europe show their appreciation by cheering from their windows and balconies. The scene unfolding in Spain as they see the medical workers travel beneath. The same is happening in Italy, France, Greece, and the Netherlands. These frontline healthcare workers are, are doing their part as citizens. They know the, their role in society, and they're not shirking at the responsibility just because it comes at a, at a personal danger. What's really striking to me is no one is saying, we're not gonna work. Everyone is saying, 
I'll do what I can with the equipment that I have, even if it's a risk to myself. And we've seen people die because of that. I, I'm sure they don't like the situation. I'm sure they're not comfortable with the situation, but they're doing it anyways. are real heroes those on the front lines the first responders those who roll up their sleeves and say you know what I'm willing to take that risk I'm willing to walk out there and become contaminated if that if that's what it takes just so that I could possibly save one life one incredible human being's life even at the expense of taking their own life Jesus said what greater love have there than a person who is willing to lay down their lives for their brothers and their sisters there is no greater love than this there is not any greater love than this there's all kinds of different degrees of love there's selfish love there's ungrateful love there's modest love there's tangible love there's psychological love there's spiritual love but when it becomes to agape love the true Agape love has now been tested pertaining to the pandemic that has fallen up onto the world in such drastic ways that we can't even begin to famine. Those who was willing to pull up their shirt sleeves and say, you know what, I'm going to do this even at the expense of of it taking my life to try to save someone else's life. That is heroic. That is courageous. That is love. Love that goes beyond anything that most people can ever even begin to famine. That's what the world has been tested on in the past few months since COVID-19, the coronavirus, has spread all over the world. This will be an incredible moment that we actually monitor this moment similar towards the birth of Christ. And the reason why I say similar towards, because this is not going to be the death of humanity, but rather than the new beginning of humanity, pertaining to the year of the Jubilee. This is going to be a moment of time where we as a society will always be able to look back in 2020, the matching numbers, 2-2, 2, -2. two, -zero, two -zero. And this will be the time when we'll be able to all have something in common, regardless whether we speak English, French, Spanish, regardless whether we come from Honduras, or Russia, or Canada, or Ireland, or Africa, or China, or Australia. This will be something that we'll all be able to relate to each other about. Those who fight, those who struggle, and those who make it to be able to be a witness of such of a horrendous moment such as this. I said from the beginning in January that this is going to be something that's going to exceed 
9-11 a thousand fold. And it has. It hasn't just exceeded towards the death rate right now here in America being over 50,000 and almost 3 million worldwide. But the horrendous economical sacrifice that it has taken not just upon the American government but all governments up onto this planet and it's basically a wake-up call for we the people uh, I, I look at it as a second chance that God is saying okay I've stopped you I've got your attention this demon has been unleashed because so many of you was biting the hand that was feeding feeding you, which was God. You didn't appreciate me. So I backed up long enough to uh, let you be on your own for a while. And this is a wake-up call for humanity, not just in getting our own personal lives in order, of how we treat each other and how we are subservient unto God Almighty through the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's also a wake-up call pertaining to how that we're treating the planet. How we're treating the wildlife. How we're treating the mammal life. How we're treating the forest. This is a wake-up call for people to regenerate, reorganize, mo moderate, what we've already got and make it even better. There's a lot of these fuselages pertaining to aviation that needs to go to the boneyard. They don't know where even come close to meeting EPA standards. There's a lot of these factories, especially overseas in India and Africa, not Africa, but India and, and China that could care less about EPA standards towards what kind of carbon dioxide that they're pumping off into the atmosphere. It's time to modify. It's time to reiterate. It's time to do it the way that it's supposed to be done if we as a society living on one planet. We don't have two planets to choose from. And we for darn sure don't have three. I mean, they can talk about the space station all they want. But the fact of the matter is, they're not going to be able to get 7 billion people or 8 billion people, however many people's on the planet. They're not going to be able to get us all on a space station if this thing was to implode. This is our wake-up call, folks. This was a God thing. This was a supernatural thing that has occurred that has been so, so devastating in so many people's lives. And it talks about that in the Bible pertaining to the great sorrows. It says that the great sorrows will fall upon the humanity in such of a way such as mankind has never seen before. We are now experiencing that. We are now experiencing by seeing biblical Bible prophecy come true in its fullest form. In its fullest form. This is GPS, the global public square. Welcome to all of you in the United States and around the world. I'm Fareed Zakaria. Today on the show, Bill Gates, the head of the world's largest charitable foundation. What do we now know about this strange virus and its effects? Has the lockdown worked? Is America ready to open up for business again? Will we have a vaccine? And when? I will ask Bill Gates these questions and more. Also, where in the world did the virus come from? Was it from a wet market or a Chinese lab? Will we ever know? We will get the latest science from one of the world's foremost virus detectives. Finally, in this Earth Week, I'll tell you about the silver linings in the COVID crisis for Mother Earth. But first, here's my take. Poor Brian Kemp, he obviously didn't get the memo. 
When the governor of Georgia announced on Monday that he was going to begin opening up his state's economy, he must have assumed that President Trump would lavish him with praise. After all, just days earlier, the president had said publicly the country was starting our life again and indicated that some states were ready to open up. On Wednesday, Trump tweeted, states are safely coming back. Our country is starting to open for business again. And yet, hours after that tweet, at his daily press conference, the president announced that he disagreed strongly with Kemp's decision. Welcome to Donald Trump's re-election strategy where he is both the government and the fiery opposition to that government. Populism has always fundamentally been a protest movement of outsiders railing against a corrupt elite that runs the country. Right-wing populism additionally makes a distinction between the real people and the others who tend to be foreigners, immigrants, blacks, Jews, and other minorities. Now this strategy works well when you're out of government. Once you're inside though, you face a challenge. Politicians who win elections usually try to broaden their base and unify the nation. But populism depends on division and dissatisfaction. In addition, in times of genuine emergency, people sober up. Across the world, many populist parties that frivolously attack the establishment have struggled to make their voices heard. In a pandemic, it turns out, many people want their governments to take an active stance, preferably based on advice from experts. Trump's solution is to play insider and outsider simultaneously. One day he announces a careful plan devised by public health officials that announces a step-by-step -step process for opening up. The next day he sides with street protesters against governors who are following those very guidelines. It's a complicated dance. You can watch the two Trumps at his press conferences. He begins the session as President Trump, making the day's official pronouncements, reading in a dreary monotone from a script he doesn't appear to have looked at before. And then from time to time, Donald Trump, the populist icon, suddenly pops up, commenting on his own script. For example, to say, after recommending the use of masks, This is voluntary. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. The Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde routine continues throughout the briefing. As his own that health officials take the podium to make some substantive point, Trump will jump in to say something that is at odds with the message they are trying to convey. But Trump seems worried that this dance may not be enough to win him re-election, especially as unemployment mounts. The president has surely noticed that his approval ratings remain roughly where they were before the pandemic, which is astonishing given that crises usually boost presidential approval enormously. So. He has doubled down on the attack strategy against the usual scapegoats, the media and what has become an absurd daily routine, as well as blue state governors, liberal cities, international organizations, and now, of course, most pointedly, China. He's also returning to his favorite target, immigrants. The president's ban on immigrants seeking green cards from coming into the country for 60 days is strange since the U.S. has already largely halted immigration. But it's not really a policy, it is a political symbol. A reminder to Trump's base that they can always count on him. There is, of course, another path. Donald Trump could have used the crisis to rally the nation around a common foe. He could have provided calm, sensible leadership, stayed on message with his own health officials, and fostered unity rather than division. That's the approach of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who now has a 79% approval rating. It is the strategy of Emmanuel Macron, who has moved up 10 points in his very polarized country. But it turns out that Donald Trump knows only one dance, call it the populism hustle, and he seems uninterested in learning any other. For more, go to cnn.com slash Fareed and read my Washington Post column this week, and let's get started. I will simply remind you he is one of the world's richest people and he has dedicated a large share of his fortune and his expertise to fighting diseases. He has now taken a lead role in the search for a vaccine and a cure for the coronavirus. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is funding factories for each of the seven most promising ideas for a vaccine, even though Gates freely admits that only one or maybe two of them will actually be used. I'm now joined by Bill Gates. Pleasure to have you on, Bill. 
Good to see you. So if you were to explain to people in general, would you tell them that we now know the coronavirus is more deadly, less deadly, more transmissible, less transmissible? How do you characterize this one? Um, well, we know that if we do these extreme socialization measures, we get the reproductive rate below one, which means that the total number of active infections starts to go down. What we don't know is we go slightly back to normal, which activities uh, create the risk of a rebound. And so we need to put into place a very dense testing regime so you would detect uh, that rebound going back into the exponential growth very quickly and not wait for the ICUs to fill up and there to be lots of deaths. You know, if you see the hot spot, you can understand the activities causing that. Uh, change policy there and get it back uh, down to the into the decline. So that the the brute force tactic that was used did work. It worked in you know every country, uh, but that's caused such immense damage. Now we want to back off from that, and we're a little naive about how to prioritize those activities. We need uh, the testing. We need strong leadership that where the scientific community and the Politicians are saying, okay, what's the value? Things like school obviously have a very high value if we can figure out a format that's not driving a lot of infection. So you, you talk about testing, everybody talks about it, and it seems bizarre, you know, just from the outside, that it would be so hard. I mean, this is the richest country in the world. Um, you know, there were people have made analogies to wars during World War II. The United States went from a standing start, a zero uh, planes, to being able to produce a plane every 63 minutes in one of the, the Ford factories. Why can't testing be ramped up to the million a day level that a lot of people, uh, experts believe, would be necessary to help reopen? Yeah, so it looks like with new machines and using them in a better way, we'll be able to get up to four or 500,000 a day. That's just barely enough for really doing the tracking. There are some very innovative ways of running those machines or eventually getting the strip test that could take us to higher numbers. The key thing about the US though is this focus on the number of tests uh, understates the the cacophony and the mistakes we've made in our testing system. The access to that set testing system is very unequal. The wrong people are being tested. And anytime you don't get results in less than 24 hours, the value of the test is dramatically reduced. And so the US is unique in terms of uh, just, you know, it's who you know, whether you get in the front of the line, uh, asymptomatics can get in front of the line and you get these lines that are, that are way too long. Let me ask you about the vaccine that you know that you've been so involved in. Um, so when, when I talk to experts, it's sort of there's a range of views. One of which is, look, we may not get a vaccine. You know, we don't have vaccines against other some other coronaviruses. There are some viruses for which you don't get one. And on the other side, people are telling me, well, with so many efforts being made like yours. The government is also doing one. Uh, the British government is doing one. The Chinese are undoubtedly doing one we'll actually end up with a vaccine much faster than people are predicting. Well, it's very hard to compress these time frames. And, you know, if everything went perfectly, we'd be in scale manufacturing within a year. Uh, we may not achieve that. It could be as long as two years. There's over 100 efforts. What we need to do is pick the most promising of those, get money, so we're going full speed, build the manufacturing in parallel, some of which is shared like the fill finish, which is the last step uh, where there's nowhere near the capacity for the 7 billion doses. So we need to do that. But are you optimistic it'll be on the shorter end? I mean, I've heard people say maybe by December we could imagine starting production. No, I mean, I don't. The, you know, Moderna, you have to do these phase three studies that help you understand if somebody has a condition X or Y or Z, does it create a side effect? You know, there's people with defective immune systems. There's all sorts of things. So the size of the phase three, the global regulators are going to have to get together and decide how many people, what length of time that goes in. And you'll have to trial where there's a very heavy infection rate. So, uh, you know, the, the idea of being in manufacture by the end of the year, that's beyond my... Uh, 
what's well, likely. Dr. Fauci and I have you know, been fairly consistent in saying 18 months to not create uh, expectations that are too high because this influences, short of a miracle set of therapeutics, this influences when we get to go back to true normal. And the thing about it is, like he's talking about there, they're going to have to get volunteers to basically be guinea pigs to do search and procedure on. In other words, they got to go through this, this uh, timetable of figuring out <clears throat> if you're going to have a lot of a lot of uh, setbacks in regard to how people respond to this particular new drug. And then, of course, you're going to have to manufacture the drug. And you're going to have to manufacture the drug to be able to hit that silver line, that's that, that balance, that it doesn't create too much of a problem on this side versus not enough influences on the other side. And I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but, but it has to be a balance there. And um, I'm kind of like Mr. Bill Gates to think that this is going to be up and over with in just a year. is probably uh, uh, gullible wishful thinking in a way because these diseases, they have basically a mind of their own and you can use a trillion different strategies and until you find that right one that hits that balance for all the races for everybody it can be uh, it can be a relentless avenue that people are taking that it isn't just they're not going to be able to solve this just overnight it would be it would be incredibly nice to think that it could. And of course, there's always that billionth of chance out of a billion that it could possibly happen, but the odds of it happening that quick is probably going to be slim to none. That's what Mr. Gates was talking about right there. Let's listen to the rest of this because I find it to be very, very intriguing in how that the doctors and the nurses and the scientists and everybody has jumped on the same bandwagon <clears throat> in trying to eradicate this enemy that has caused so much havoc upon this planet. It's fascinating to finally see where everybody can agree on something even if it is prolonging death, that everybody can finally agree on something and get on board with the same subject and with the same ideal towards trying to eradicate the same enemy. To me, that's fascinating. Because we haven't been able to agree on nothing in the past 25, 30, 40 years especially since modern day TV and satellite and internet and social media and all this other stuff has come on board. So we have finally gotten to the point that we all realize that we're all in the same boat together. As I was saying a while ago, we don't have planet A, planet B, and planet C that we could choose from. God put us all on one planet. And whenever something like this erupts globally in a pandemic, we have to all scratch our heads at the same time and say, wow, how can we beat this? How can we eradicate this? Next on GPS, Bill Gates on when and how the economy will come back.
coronavirus. That billion dollars to fighting COVID-19. Let me ask you about the economy. Um, <coughs> When trying to open up, one of the challenges is some states are opening up uh, earlier than others. Uh, some countries are opening up earlier. Um, can we be sure, uh, we, you know, that we know uh, what exactly the right levers are and how to open up? And I ask this because uh, there are a lot of governors, for example, who are criticizing the uh, the predictions that were made. The Florida governor says, "Look." There were all these models that predicted to us that we would need 200,000, 300,000 hospital beds in use for COVID. We have 2,000 beds. In other words, the predictions were way off. We didn't, you know, and, and the implication is they didn't do an enormous amount of the hardcore lockdown, and they're still okay. What do you say to them? Well, I wouldn't say they're okay. They're not suffering as widespread an epidemic yet. Uh, if they open up enough, they can go back into exponential growth and, you know, compete with New York on that basis. The uncertainties about this mean that because of the exponential nature of this, yes, some models were wildly wrong. You know, models are never going to be perfect in these things. But we can learn, you know, when you have countries uh, that are sending, say, young children back to school, uh, Germany, Denmark, Austria have a good enough testing regime uh, you know, more competent than the U.S., so they actually will be able to see the effect of that. Norway is actually doing it in a differential within different parts of the country, which will help inform us. The problem with the United States is that unless you interdict travel, any state that goes too far and gets into that exponential growth will be seeding other parts of the country, and so it'll be like international travel, where you have force of infection coming in, and that's very tricky <coughs> to deal with. But. Uh, you know, the, the need for the testing piece, I, you know, I don't, I haven't found anyone to argue with it, but uh, they, uh, they're not stepping up to actually do it yet, uh, and that's got to be the federal level. Um, so w everyone says when we open, it's going to be slow, it's only going to be parts of the economy, people have estimated 20%, 30%. Um, Give us, you know, the, the best case scenario. Um, you know, you've, you've heard this metaphor of the hammer and the dance. The dance being now you start opening up these, uh, uh, the economy and through a kind of moderate amount of uh, social distancing, you are able to achieve. What will we be able to achieve? What's the, what's the good case scenario? You know, the best case is you pick the high value activities like school, manufacturing, construction, and figure out a way to do those with kind of masks and distancing, you know, in the school, you don't want the hallways to have tons of kids all at once or the lunchroom. Um, and then you can see, is that, a, are those schools a source of infection spreading up into the elderly, uh, which then, you know, would, would cause some level of mortality. I'm uh, hopeful Bill, that can I, way can, I, yeah. can I just ask you about schools? Because everyone is so, is so curious and worried about this. You have three kids. Um, you know how schools work. I mean, Lots of people crowded together in classrooms, in dormitories, in hallways. That is almost the, the definition of school. How, how do you get it going? Well, certainly for the younger age kids where the online substitute is inferior, uh, more inferior than as you get up, say, to college level, that online can capture, at least in terms of the academics, a lot of, of what uh, goes on there. You know, what we've seen in terms of infection levels is pretty low. And you do have uh, some European countries uh, that are moving ahead with that. And because of their testing, will understand uh, what the viral load is and, you know, compare households with kids going to school versus households that don't have that uh, coming in. Uh, so over the course of this summer, some of that will be learned. And in the fall, that will be one of the toughest questions. It's right on the boundary of, is there a tasteful way to do it that, that particularly for the low-income students where the online learning hasn't been fully enabled because either they don't have the equipment or the connection or their teacher isn't set up for it. Uh, you know, the inequity has gotten greater in education. Uh, so if we can figure out how to do K through 12 in the fall, uh, that would be good. I even think if, if we're creative about it and things have gone well, uh, we'll be able to do college. But there's a lot of data we'll be uh, learning from globally uh, 
uh, and we'll see the progress on the tools as well that will inform those decisions. So it'll probably be in August where, you know, the idea of what's the protocol, uh, how many schools are, are uh, opening up that, you know, we won't really know enough until pretty close to the, the start. And also, I would like to weigh in on that. Who's to say that a lot of these schools and a lot of these states won't modify their teaching methods and basically become online teachers more so than classroom teachers? You know, we know for a fact that a lot of your parenting teachers are finding it to be more beneficial to be able to stay at home and teach your children and with everybody and their brother almost today having some sort of type of networking service pertaining to the internet uh, the time may be more beneficial for a lot of these school systems to start figuring out you know what we can do this online um, we can do this uh, effectively and probably more efficiently without the cost of having to build more schools, without the cost of more paperwork pertaining to actual books, without the cost of school buses and the concern of liability issues of having to buy buses and having to keep schools heated and cooled. Um, I think that this could possibly re-reform the teaching methods in the 21st century that probably should have already done evolved off into. <clears throat> I'm just saying that a lot of people are going to look at things differently now pertaining to social media platforming pertaining to communicating differently today than what they did before because with the highway services being so busy with our infrastructure being so bad it just makes sense that if you can do something just as a, as efficient or more efficient online why would you even think about considering going back to the old method? You know, believe it or not, teaching requires a great deal of concentration. And if you'll put a child in an environment that he or she feels most comfortable in, and it doesn't matter if it be the living room, the bedroom, the study room, the den, the garage, a tree house, whatever, you'll be surprised how much more that little Johnny or little Sally will be able to remember and become more advanced in understanding what you're trying to teach him or her. Because whenever you're in a bad environment, you have distractions. When you have distractions, you're going to have less concentration. When you have less concentration, your ability level is going to go way down in comparison to where if you was in a good, peaceful reliable, safe environment, you could really, really concentrate more so on what that you was trying to achieve. And I'll just use one particular school system, which is on the other side of the Tennessee River, uh, in between Clarksville, Tennessee, and Humphreys County. I don't forgot now what county it would be in. It wouldn't be in Humphreys County. Probably be in the same county that Dukedom would be in, or possibly Clarksville would be in, up in Middle Tennessee. But they have this elementary school 
that was built around this big pond or this big lake. And of course, anytime you're around water, it creates an atmosphere of peacefulness. Their grade level in that elementary school is a higher grade level, not just because of the teachers, per se, but because of the environment and the method that they're using to teach the children in. You know, whenever I was trying to do homework, I was having to farm, stay on a tractor sometimes to 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, then come home and try to do my homework. I had a father that didn't know how to respond and react to children, that did not have good teaching methods. He started treating us children like we was grown men at the age of eight years old and talking down to us and, and, and basically abusing us verbally and as, as well as physically. Well, whenever you put a child in that type of environment, that child is not going to be able to concentrate. That child is not going to be able to remember the things that that child was supposed to remember because they're thinking about too much other things that's going on around them. You know, I was having to think about getting my, you know what, beat almost every night because I couldn't spell a word correctly. Or I forgot how to do my algebra. Or I couldn't do my times table just right. Or I made a bad grade. I was steadily frantic not knowing how harsh that the abuse was going to be or how harsh that the hollering and the screaming was going to be. In addition to me getting off the school bus, maybe getting 15 minutes to chunk down a couple uh, ding-dong uh, or, or a banana if we had it. At the time, we was poor. We was lucky if we had it. But basically, just enough time to change my clothes and put on a bunch of ragged old clothes and go out there and start working. Regardless whether we was working hogs or working the cows or, or we was picking okra or picking tomatoes. I mean, sometimes we would have two or three acres of okra. Sometimes we would have put out a thousand slips of tomatoes. We worked. We planted cotton. At first, before we had cotton pickers, we got out there and done it manually by hand. We cotton sacks. We hauled hay. We worked. We stayed tremendously active. My, my father had two older boys than me and one younger. The youngest one escaped a lot of that work until he got old enough to work. But by and large, we was in a constant turmoil towards not only trying to do our jobs or do our homework and study, but also help dad on the farm. And if we wasn't helping dad on the farm, we was helping dad in the auto body business towards pulling off fenders and cutting cars in half. We was steadily doing something other than studying. And I feel like that this is going to be an opportunity for a lot of teachers, for a lot of uh principals, for a lot of deans, for a lot of professors to say, you know what, instead of us being out all this money and building all these buildings just to be able to teach what we need to teach, how come we can't do it online? How come we can't use a different method and our achievement levels our successful levels will be even higher than what they are now towards people remembering and knowing the facts about what they're being taught. I think it makes all the difference in the world pertaining to the environment that you're being taught in. It not just makes a difference in the teacher, but it makes a difference in the environment. And whenever you're in a distractive environment with a bunch of kids screaming and hollering, picking and poking, Staying, staying around in the hallway, doing some of the activities that kids do today that I wouldn't have even thought about doing whenever I was a kid and getting away with it. You're, you're creating an atmosphere that is an unteachable atmosphere because there's too many distractions. 
so you've you've written both in your uh, in your paper that's on your uh, on Gates notes, which I really recommend people read. Um, and you've said elsewhere, the economy is not going to be anything like uh, it was. It's going to take a long time to recover. It's going to be you know people are going to be surprised at how slow and how how fitful this is. So what is it that the stock market is seeing that you, Bill Gates, are not seeing? The stock market is now basically at a routine annual correction. It seems, you know, it it, it, it is not really factoring in, it seems to me, the kind of economy you're describing. Well, you know, some companies, their valuation, if you took out two years of earnings, there's still enough earnings out in years three to end that the valuation wouldn't change that much. And, you know, if you, so if you have companies that don't run into a liquidity problem and whose long-term profitability is, is strong, then the valuation adjustment isn't necessarily that dramatic. You do have an economy that's going to be, be operating at a lower level, and that affects all sorts of spending. There's no doubt that'll be the case uh, for years to come. Uh, and so that, you know, uh, should affect overall valuations. You know, there aren't that many great investments. I mean, buying treasury bills uh, right now doesn't seem that attractive. So I'm not as, you know, I'm an expert on vaccines and their therapy. I talk uh, to people about the economy. Like you, I find it a little uh, surprising uh, where the market is, but you know, I'm, I'm not gonna focus on that. Are you surprised that Microsoft, for example, is trading at the same price that it was in December uh, before? you know, the coronavirus? You know, tech companies uh, in some ways benefit from an acceleration of a move towards digital approaches, even though their next few years, they'll have a lot of customers that they'll be, you know, helping out, giving free licenses to, you know, where things won't, won't be as strong. Uh, so, you know, if there's any sector of the economy where you could say, okay, it's not, that drastic of a change, you'd probably pick that. But again, valuations is not the, uh, where I add, add the most value. Next on GPS, Bill Gates on China. Is that the country that is the villain of this crisis as President Trump has implied? Once more, whenever we're moving to a digital society like we are pertaining to social media platforms, we have to realize that this knowledge that has been given to us was given to us for a reason. It was being given to us for a vehicle so that we can do things more effectively and efficiently. There are certain things naturally that you can't do online. You can't do digitally. But there's other things that we can. And this is the part that we're going to have to utilize in today's society with so many people in the world so that we'll make room for the rest of the stuff that's going on and be more efficient and effective in those areas. This is a wake-up call. This is, this is going to be a new birth for the planet Earth once we finally get over this stumbling block, this burden that has been placed upon to a lot of people's lives. It's going to take some, some new innovation. It's going to take some new thinking. It's going to take maybe some sacrifice. But ultimately, in the end, save the planet. And to make room for everybody, it will ultimately be worth it. We, as a society, have to realize that this is, in fact, the only planet that we have. And if we don't take care of this planet... This planet will not take care of us. Which, of course, particularly the poorer countries are going to be hit hard for all. Like I said, if we don't take care of this planet, this planet will not take care of us. Kinds of obvious reasons. They don't have a, as good a health care system um, and things like that. Now, I've read as a result a couple of very interesting ana analyses that say, look, for these countries, there's a real question about whether they should be going for a full lockdown model, because uh, first of all, many of them have people very, you know, living in slums which are very tightly crowded. I, I grew up in Bombay. There's a, there's a slum there called Haravi, which I'm sure you visited, where the density uh, of people is 800,000 per square mile. 
to compare New York is 27,000 per square mile. So actually, if you send those people to work, you're helping them socially distance, you know, distance themselves. It's by staying at home that they're, you know, become kind of living in petri dishes. Um, there's also the fact that it's it's warmer. They have fewer old people. That for that reason, poor countries should really be thinking about this differently. Yeah, I think that's right. The this is to me the one of the greatest uncertainties is the reported cases coming out of developing countries, whether it's India. Pakistan, uh, Nigeria, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, those case numbers are still fairly small. Now, you know, we funded ramping up that testing capacity, but it's still limited. You know, there are reasons people might not want to come forward to volunteer uh, to be tested. The initial spread is probably more amongst the international travelers. That's a fairly narrow group of people, but sadly, unless there's some magic positive factor we don't understand, eventually the slums you're talking about uh, will experience very widespread infection. And the social isolation measures probably can't get the reproductive rate below one. Uh, and, you know, people need food and, you know, if the government tries to overdo things, you'll get, you know, riots, starvation, uh, you know, you could have a complete collapse in civil order if you're not careful. So. I do think the creativity of how you reduce the infection rate while making sure people still get uh, food, that's really an unsolved problem. It's, it, it worked for the rich countries with that gigantic economic price, and it might not in these countries. And how did they get out of it economically? And of course, you also have to keep in mind it's based upon the geographics of the country to where if you're talking about a country like an island like Puerto Rico um, that hit by, got hit by a major uh, hurricane, that in and of itself can cause an economical collapse to the point that you have civil unrest. So you have to put all these things into equation and like I have said and I'll say again, the scripture says to flee into the mountains whenever you shall see these things start to occur. And the people have yet to realize that our oceans is rising, our environments are changing, these hurricanes that ordinarily only builded up into a category four or category five once every hundred years. Now we're seeing them not over 20 years, not over 10 years, but now we're seeing them every year. Every year we have a hurricane of a category three, four, or five. 200 mile an hour winds. And whatever that it hits, if it's close to the water, don't matter if it's an island or, or you're just inland, uh, it's going to cause major destruction. So a lot of this also depends upon the location, the geographics of where you are. If you're fortunate enough that you're inland, you're high, you don't have to worry about hurricanes, that's good. But then you have the other concepts, which is what if you're out in California and you have all this vegetation and it gets dry again? Well, you got to put all that into the equation because it can cause civil unrest. Exactly. I mean, what did the you know the United States at some level can print money? Um, most of these countries have to borrow. They have to borrow in international markets. It's much much harder. What happens here? Well, I'm afraid a great deal of. Uh, hardship, uh, you know, even things like routine vaccination, the rates are going down and that alone will account for a lot of deaths. The measles campaigns that are important, uh, that, you know, we've been modeling out, out what it means. So, you know, things at the basic level of very basic healthcare, very basic sustenance are much tougher. And so sadly, as is the case in most bad situations, the poor countries and the poor citizens will be the ones who bear the brunt of the burden. And all the more reason that the world should uh, get the billions uh, to build the tools and get those tools not just to the countries who finance them or have the great scientific 
uh, and manufacturing capability, but get them to the entire globe. You've been making this case for international cooperation uh, very uh, powerfully and to my mind persuasively. Um, there is right now in Washington a very different mood, which is to say, uh, far from cooperating with the second largest economy in the world, it is China that is to blame for this virus. You've been following this very carefully. How would you respond to the charge that, look, the Chinese covered this up, uh, they essentially deceived uh, the rest of the world, and as a result, they should be held in some way responsible for this? Well, I don't think that's a timely thing because it doesn't affect how we act today. Uh, you know, China did a lot of things right. You know, at the beginning, like any country where a virus first shows up, you know, they can look back and say where they, they missed some things. Uh, you know, a lot of the, their, you know, some countries did respond very quickly and get their testing in place and they avoided the incredible economic pain. And it's sad that even the U.S. that you would have expected to do this well uh, did it particularly poorly. But it's not time to talk about that. But this is the time to take the great science we have, the fact that we're in this together, uh, you know, fix testing, treatments, and get that vaccine, and, you know, minimize the trillions of dollars uh, and many things that you can't even dimensionalize in economic terms uh, that are awful about the situation that we're in. So that's a distraction. Uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, incorrect and unfair things said, but it's not even time for that discussion. You've worked a lot with the WHO over the years. Um, what do you think of the... And, you know, I've heard that again and again and again. Whenever we have a massive slain here in the United States pertaining to a school being shot, or a nightclub where you have 50 or 60 fatalities, or you have some idiot that kicks out a window in Las Vegas and decides to pepper spray a couple thousand people and kill 50 or 60 people, however many it was. I've heard that again and again and again. Well, this isn't the time to be talking about gun lobbyist rights pertaining to our amendment. And I disagree. I think it is time to talk about it. Because as the old saying goes, you strike the iron while the iron's hot. We want to know what China done. We want to know how China failed and why they failed pertaining to world health. And how come that they didn't do what they were supposed to have done towards raising the red flags in warning the rest of the world. We want to know how come China did not stop their international travel knowing that that virus was being transmitted from one person to another and now they was putting the rest of the world at risk. We want to know if it started in some sort of a laboratory regardless whether it was intentional or not intentional or, rather not, it was coming from their wet markets where they eat fish, eat raw squid, eat raw bats, and do things in a primitive, prehistoric way that they shouldn't be doing to begin with. Yes, this is the time to strike the iron. Because the iron is hot. So what Bill Gates just got through doing was a cover-up towards not looking at the problem where the problem originated from. Now, if he thinks that it's going to cause too many ripples or too many waves because he's got too much interest in China affairs, I truly understand. We understand the reason why Bill Gates kind of wanted to take that subject and push it over to the side and didn't really want to get involved in that subject because he's got too much to lose as far as making too many investors mad over in China. But you know what? Once more, what's more important? Investments? Money? Or human fatalities? The, the, the human life consumption outweighs this is not the right time. And in reality, 
this is the perfect time. Just like if there's a massive school shooting down in Florida, it's time for the people to stand up and say enough is enough whenever it comes to people owning these high-powered semi or automatic uh, high magazine assault rifles that are not used for hunting but are used for war and they can stand behind any kind of delirious delusional excuse that they want to but the fact of the matter is those type of weaponry warfare should not be sold to the general public. I don't care if you live in Florida or if you're in Alaska. Now, if you was living in Alaska 200 years ago, you probably needed something like that. Because instead of just worrying about one bear, you possibly had to worry about two or 3,000 bears. Or if you was living in America, and let's say instead of you having one buffalo, you had 2,000 buffalo. And you had to defend yourself because you had 2,000 pounds, 2,000 buffalo coming at you that weighed 2,000 pounds apiece. And the only way that you could have popped them off towards preventing, prevented them from running over your house and destroying your property and destroying your land was to basically stand out there with a machine gun and shoot them as they was coming on. We're no longer living in those days. We don't have wild buffalo that roams in herds of two or 3,000 right here ordinarily in the United States of America. I mean, there still are very few herds that, that roam that way, way up in places like Montana, uh, way up into the Yellowstone National Park, uh, but very, very few. And those are usually confined in areas that you don't necessarily have to worry about them becoming that abrupt or that crazy around the general population. So yes, this is the time to talk about what happened, why it happened, how come we pay people to do a certain task and they failed not just the American people, but the world. They put the world in peril because enough people didn't raise enough red flags and enough concerns in confining it and keeping it in one area. They would have expected the same thing out of the Americans if something like that would have erupted here in America and we would have kept it hush-hush and we would have kept all our air travel going out to all these different places, they would have, the world would have, would, have, would have held us accountable and said, how come y'all did not let us know that this was coming down the pike? They would have held us responsible and accountable. So why is China any better or any lesser towards being held accountable in today's society according to the world? They shouldn't be. I don't care if you're Bill Gates or you're Donald Trump or you're whoever. They should be held accountable to the world's questions and the world's accountability standards on a global level. Period. Period. And you can make up the excuse, well, this isn't the right time. Well, when is it going to be the right time? Five years from now? Ten years from now? If it happens again, when it happens again, is that going to be the right time? Charged it. That's what's got us in trouble. Every time a major occurrence happens here in America, we want to brush it off. We want to sweep it under the rug. We want to pretend like it's out of sight, out of mind. This isn't the right time. This isn't the right generation to deal with this. We're going to kick the can down the road and we're going to let some other generation deal with this. This is what has got us in trouble. It's this type of thinking and this type of irresponsibility. And to me, Bill Gates should be shamed because he should address the problem properly pertaining to China and the disease coming from that area.
they didn't push back hard enough or maybe were even complicit in China doing a certain amount of deception and not revealing everything they did. China did not give WHO the access uh, that they should have, um, also the CDC. Do you think the WHO is culpable? Basically, no. I mean, in the retrospective, we'll see things that... W Basically, no. Well, if they're not responsible, then who should be? A kindergartner child? A newborn? The man up in the, the woman in the space station is stayed at birth for nine months? Who should be responsible? Come on! WHO could have done better, just like every actor in this whole picture. Uh, but the, you know, the... Let's back it up. Sorry about that. Basically, no. I mean, in the retrospective, we'll see things that WHO could have done better, just like every actor in this whole picture. Uh, but the, you know, the WHO has a strong connection with one country. Uh, that country is the United States. The number of CDC people who are there, or people who used to work for the CDC, there's no UN agency more connected to a country than WHO is to CDC. People think WHO is funded to do all sorts of things that their tiny little budget doesn't let them do. Uh, you know, so they're a thousandth, their budget is a thousandth of what's spent on healthcare in the U.S. They don't invent vaccines, they don't understand vaccine factories, but what they do is very, very important. You know, the eradication of smallpox, the progress on polio eradication, it's a phenomenal organization that we're more dependent on them today to drive things than we ever have been. And so, you know, we need to support them, help them, and, you know, at the right time, fine, think about uh, for pandemic two, how should all of us do a lot better? You have been caught up in this controversy where you have now, you and, and Dr. Fauci are the targets of a certain, you know, kind of right wing campaign saying uh, you, you, you guys are in some way part of a conspiracy. Does it does it does it bother you? Does it affect the way you need, you need to do your work? Well, it is. There's a certain irony that, you know, having put a lot of energy in to try to warn about this uh, vulnerability uh, and not getting much investment to be made. Uh, sadly, you know, I always think, could I? How could I have gotten the message out in a stronger way? Where did I fall short? Because you know, only five percent of what should have been done was done. The irony of having that person be accused of creating the virus, you know, seems uh, a bit strange. I don't know that a meaningful number of people believe that. It, it does kind of get amplified. Uh, you know, there are people who want to view this through a political lens, not a scientific lens. And, you know, that uh, can lead you to, you know, some strange views about let's not, you know, speak the truth or look at the real numbers or compare countries in a rational way. You look at it in a realistical, rational way in accountability issues. I just looked at some of my footage on my YouTube channel. I was putting out material the last part of January of Red Alert, Red Alert, Red Alert, trying to influence my viewers that a pandemic was coming. Understanding what I was seeing on national TV that was happening over in China. I actually waited a whole 24 hours before I was hesitant on putting out such of an alert because of the controversy that fell up into my life right up here in Weekly County, Tennessee, in Martin, Tennessee, of a group of people that was trying to promote me as me being somebody that wanted to bring false information to the general public. I was actually charged with falsifying files, which basically means some idiot that wanted to spook the general public by causing a panic if you was in the middle of a theater and you started screaming, fire, 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 or if you was in a schoolhouse and you pulled the fire alarm, creating panic, okay, 
that reaches the level of a potential homegrown terrorist. I just had to fight these idiots up here in Martin, Tennessee. Law enforcement as well as the judges and the attorneys over that case that happened in my personal life in 2005 that affected me and me not being prominent and Johnny on the spot towards not putting this information out to the general public as quickly as I should have had. Now, who is accountable for not doing their jobs? Whenever it comes to being the watchman on the wall. It talks about these matters in Ezekiel, Isaiah, in the Bible. That if you do not warn the general public whenever you see danger, and it doesn't matter if it's a danger pertaining to a meteor coming out of the sky, a danger pertaining to a war, uh, a, a group of people that's coming to invade you, it doesn't matter if it's danger pertaining to a, a disease, danger is danger. Accountability is accountability. The world health. The disease control people that are in control of these matters should be held accountable. China should be held accountable for not being transparent and for not letting the rest of the world know that this was something that was drastic and horrendous that was lethal. I've done the best that I could do. What else could I have done? I'm not Bill Gates. I don't have deep pockets. If I did, I would have probably opened up my own radio station. Well, I say that. Uh, I had a radio station program up here in Union City, and they knocked me off the airwaves because certain people disagreed with my tactics or they disagreed with my message. Uh, but if I was Bill Gates, I would have chose to have used some other type of method towards getting my message out there to the general public. If I had to have, I would have hired an airplane to have driven around day after day after day with a big long banner on the back of it saying, get ready, get ready, a pandemic is coming. I would have done other drastic things if I had deep enough pockets, but I didn't have those deep pockets. So I could only use what tool that I had at the time to use it, which was my YouTube platform. I put the message out there. The president, I put messages out there to Secret Service, Homeland Security, governors, mayors, judges, um, law enforcement agencies, ex-law enforcement agencies, U.S. Marshals, lieutenants, admirals. I put the information out there to the people. They didn't listen. Because obviously, they looked at the source and said, well, we're not going to believe this individual. Let's look at the source. Let's judge the book by the cover. Similar towards the message that I've been putting out now to the, to the church society for the past 30 years. They still did not want to support the ministry that supported wide world universal peace and love and grace. The same teachings that Jesus Christ taught out of the King James Version Bible. If they did, I would have a strong congregation today similar towards Joe Osteen but I don't have that strong congregation. I do have a few secret admirers, and I do have a few people that will tell you we believe in Juby. We support Juby's ideals and Juby's uh, theories and, and what he's teaching. We support peace. We support love. We support these things. There's a few people out there that will stand up and be accountable. But by and large, for the past 30 years, these people didn't want peace. These people did not want tranquility. They didn't want to see the manifestations of the Bible um, elevating to the level of it becoming true. If they did, they would have got in behind the ministry, the windmill ministries. 
And we're just not talking about people right here locally. We're talking about people in the whole West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee area, people up in Virginia, West Virginia, Washington, New York, Queens, Long Island, people up in Kentucky, people out in Oklahoma, people down in, in Florida, people over in uh, Arizona, people out in California, people down in, in uh, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, the message got out there. The message got out there. But there wasn't no supporters. And as far as I know, there still isn't no obvious supporters. There may be a few secret Meyer supporters. But as far as people actually getting in behind the ministry and partnering up with the Windmill Ministries, I still don't see that today. Even though the world's gone to hell in a handbasket. And I can literally say that today, not just figuratively, but literally, pertaining to all this terrorism and all these problems and all this indebtedness, and now top it off with the coronavirus, COVID-19. So I can literally say that the ministry did not fail the people, but the people failed the ministry. Once more, pointing their finger saying, oh, he's only doing that for a celebrity stunt. Trust me, if I wanted to become a celebrity, I could have done a thousand other things to become famous for. I could have created something. I could have got good in music. I could have created my own rock band. I could have opened my own body shop. I could have done a thousand different things other than preaching this message out of the Bible towards being a messenger for God. But yet, no, I stood with the message because I knew and know and still know that the message is true pertaining to the opening of the seals, pertaining to the two witnesses, pertaining to seeing uh, a literal Satan being transfigurated in a humanly bodily form that most of these people around here thought that I was a nitwit forever even thinking about the ideal. Not understanding that the false prophet and the Antichrist comes within the opening of the black horse and the pale horse and not before. We've got a group of people that was bamboozled, that was deceived, and they still to this day want to point their finger and say that I was the one that was deceived. No, 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 no. I was not the one that was deceived whenever the two hands miraculously come out of heaven that the Spirit of God entered into my, into my body and a 1979 Buick Regal should have cut me completely, totally in half. But rather than it cut me in half, it put so much pressure on my adamant area that it busted my spleen and I lost nine units of blood. No, no, no. I was not the one that was imagining these things whenever I have documentation to prove them. Just like the documentation towards me going to Kenton, Tennessee and trying to seek help. And instead of me getting help after my biological father attacked me with 64 staples still up and down my belly, the type of help that I got was being branded as being somebody that was a nut. And they basically patted my father, Bobby Jackson, James Robert Jackson, on the back in Kenton, Tennessee, and told him what kind of good job that he'd done whenever they should have charged him for um, attempted murder. Because you do not treat a patient by attacking them the way that he attacked me. Unless I was threatening his life in a physical form, that what he done towards attacking me and laying his hands on my body and beating the back of my head and beating the back of my back the way that he did. And if it wasn't for his brother, J.W., that pulled him off of me, that should have been an instant charge towards attempted murder. But the people over in Kenton, Tennessee, Damian Cross, Don Curry, and other law enforcement agencies over there didn't see it that way, did they? Just like they didn't see it uh, uh, the way that it should have been looked at pertaining to Tybee Moore whenever certain people took my own brother down on his own property and took his own gun and tried to take his life. That should have been a 15-year charge for attempted murder. 
What the hell is wrong with these people around here when it comes to law enforcement? Do they not know that you're not supposed to do stuff like that towards putting hands on people and physically trying to kill them or do damage to them? Obviously, they didn't care what happened not only to me, but they didn't care what happened to David, David Jeffrey Jackson. They didn't care what happened to none of the family that was being raised up by a lunatic that had World War II scars because he was in World War II towards being a drill sergeant. Once more, the community let the family down. The family didn't let the community down. The neighborhood, the people let the ministry down. The ministry didn't let the people down. The ministry hadn't changed. The concept, the ideal... The message has not changed coming from the messenger after 30-something years. Boy, they sure was hoping it would, though. Oh, yeah, they was hoping that I would run out of here like a dog with his tail tucked between its legs. Shows you how demented, delusional, and how cruel and insensitive that this area is that allowed for such of a thing to happen to the family. Uh, but hey, we've got to get our heads down here and look at these therapeutics. A lot will fail, but some of the, the ones that are less celebrated, uh, I'm very hopeful for. Bill Gates, always a pleasure to have you on. Th hopeful for what? Hopeful for covering up the truth? Hopeful for letting the, the guilty get away with murder? that should have alerted the whole world in letting us know on accountability issues that the pandemic was coming? Hopeful for what, Bill Gates? That your business transactions are still all intact in China? Whenever it comes to money being more important than life, that's whenever society needs to stop and reevaluate his priorities. I have said that all along. Whenever we take taxpayer money and we'll spend $500 million on a brand new Coliseum, but yet now we'll let our veterans do without and live on the streets. We'll let our senior citizens that's living in places do without. Society was due for this wake-up call. They was due for it. Whenever you have a society here in America that has been so upside down, not just on a personal level, but on a wide view level, whenever you have a society that has gotten this far out of focus to the point of becoming this corrupt and this unjust, that's whenever the big guy upstairs will lift his umbrella of protection and he'll show you if you keep knocking on the devil's door long enough, he'll open it up and he'll say, sick em, boy, do your job. You're out to kill, steal, and destroy. Show them how invincible that they truly are, that all these people thinks that they're not invincible, that they're, I guess, like gods or something. I don't know. So many people walking around thought that something like this could never occur, that God would not never, ever allow for anything like this to ever happen to humanity. I got news for you. God done the exact same thing during the Great Flood. God done the exact same thing during Sodom and Gomorrah. And God has done the exact same thing in other cultures, in other ways, regardless whether it come in the form of a pandemic, or it come in the form of a hurricane, or it come in the form of a volcano, or it come in the form of an earthquake, or it come in the form of a, a meteor hitting the earth. Don't think that mankind 
is unrelentless whenever it comes to being chastised by God Almighty. Just like it talks about in the first four chapters of Revelations, for as many as I love, I will chasten and will rebuke. For I rather thee either be hot or cold, those who are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. And as far as I am concerned, it was the lukewarmers it was the fence straddlers that didn't want to support the windmill ministries. They didn't, they didn't not support the windmill ministries because they did not see my passion. They did not see, they did not support the windmill ministries because they did not see my drive. They did not support the windmill ministries because they didn't think that I was sincere because they knew all these things from top to bottom. The reason why that they didn't want to support the windmill ministries was because they themselves was a fence straddler, they was pretenders, and they was playing games with God the whole time. And they was hoping that eventually I would run out of juice. I would run out of steam. They was hoping eventually I would be like that whip dog and I would take that tail and put it between them legs and I would come scorching my way out of Weekly County into the unknown oblivion. Yelping just like a whipped animal. Woo! That's what they was hoping. Most of these neighbors around here knew exactly what was happening at 291 Thompson Road and at 430 Beach Grove Road. Not only did they know it in the year 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, leading up to 2018 and where we are now, but the same group of people knew what was going on in 1967, 68, 69, 72, 74, 1976, 1977, until I finally got enough gumption and got old enough to get out on my own and get the hell away from this type of abuse and start living my own life. There will be people the Robinsons, the Bakers, the Willises, the Nelsons, the Hills, the Cobles, the Neils, the Moors, the Wainscots, the Waterfields, the, Ra uh, the uh, uh, Harrisons, the Feenies. The Coopers, the Halls, the Wallaces. I could go on and on and on and on with names that will be held accountable for the things that they know that was going on in this on this property, but they remained quiet. And the reason why they remain quiet is because it wasn't happening to them. It wasn't happening to their daughters. It wasn't happening to their sons. It wasn't happening to their cousins or to their nephews or to their nieces. It was happening to the Jacksons. And because it was happening to the Jacksons, who gives a damn? Who gives a damn? If old Bob is going to rat and rave... And treat his family that way. They deserve it. Even though it was old Bob. That fought in World War II. That become scarred and marred. Pertaining to post-traumatic stress syndrome. PTSD. That had a sickness and an illness. That obviously. 
even the Whites, even the Willises, even the McClanahans didn't give a damn about. It's really sad what has put us where we are right now. It's really sad that this individual right here walked around the problem pertaining to China and who should be held accountable whenever it comes to accountability issues of knowing the severity of what this has cost in the world. And I don't know what kind of investments that he has in China and right now at this point in time I could really care less because there was a time that I really thought a lot about Bill Gates. I thought he was a remarkable engineer. I thought he had some excellent concepts. And I thought that that he was basically a, an Einstein. But now, I'm beginning to have a change of heart about him. Because it's obvious, rather than him wanting to stand up in accountability issues and if it walks like a duck talks like a duck sounds like a duck odds are it's going to be a duck instead of him being a straight shooter pertaining to China his words was well now is not the time well if now is not the time Mr. Gates when exactly is the time just like a school shooting if it's not time to talk about gun laws, if it's not time to talk about assault rifles, machine guns, AK-47s, ARs, and all these other high magazine guns, if it's not time, when is the time? Whenever it happens again, whenever your investments continue to grow, while everybody else is being slain, either slain by a bullet or being slain by a disease, when is it time? When is it time to talk about the time that we need to talk about, Mr. Gates? When is the time? I believe the time is now that the world needs to put China in the hot seat towards what they have done. Now, Kim Young, Young, or whatever his name is over in North Korea, they're saying that he has had some sort of a episode pertaining to having an operation on his heart. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe he got word through China. Maybe my concept was right. Maybe it was North Korea that started this disease. And maybe China is looking at him cross-eyed towards saying, we're coming after you. You're going to be held accountable for this. And rather than Kim Young-Young being the big Kim Young-Young that everybody wants to think he is towards not being afraid of nothing, even though he's held basically the world at hostage with nuclear bombs... Maybe he's faking his death right now towards making the world think that he's died of a heart attack. It falls back on accountability. It all falls back on we're in this boat together. There's only one planet. And if we destroy ourselves, and if we destroy this planet, we destroy any possibility of ever rebooting it and starting it all over again. And that's exactly where I think that we was heading to. We was heading in a direction before this pandemic hit. We was heading in the direction of basically doomsday. Because the doomsday clock had done already kept being moved up, 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 and I, if I'm not mistaken, the doomsday clock was within two seconds, or maybe a second and a half, of hitting the 12 o'clock straight up and down mark. And if we ever hit that mark, 
towards doomsday, that means it's over, Bill Gates. And it's not only over for Bill Gates, but it's over for you, it's over for me, it's over for every other individual of the seven, eight trillion billion people on the planet. Now, is money that important that you're willing to sacrifice eight billion people for the almighty dollar so you can walk around in your cashmere hundred dollar, hundred and twenty five, maybe a two hundred dollar sweater and your five hundred dollar slippers? Is it worth it to you? Because it's not to us. Whenever it comes to accountability. There's only one planet. And we need to take care of that planet. And if we don't take care of the planet, the planet will not take care of us. That's the bottom line. If we're going to learn anything at all about this pandemic that God has allowed to fall upon to society, we need to learn that if we don't take care of the planet and take care of each other, eventually the planet will not take care of us. That's what we need to learn in the essence of the doomsday that moved awful close to the straight up and down mark. We was right there at it to the point that I think, personally, I believe that the world was fixing to implode. And now I've talked to others that believe the same thing. With all this airplane travel, all this smog, all this back talk, what, what Congress and, and the Senate done in January towards basically giving the President of the United States a green light towards what he done to the Ukrainians, making fun of the Russian investigation, and then downsizing in the beginning pertaining to this pandemic towards it would just go away. It would just fade away. And now after 50,000 people has been jerked out from underneath us here in America alone, and almost 3 million people have been killed, and we ain't even seen the end of this thing yet. You know, they're still talking 12 to 18 months before they even come close to some sort of a some sort of a, a, a anti-venom that'll fight against it. God only knows that the suffering and the pain that we're going to have to go through. But yet, no, this isn't the right time to talk about accountability issues. So when is the right time? May God have mercy on all of us as we're walking off into this situation if we do not learn from this situation and grow from this situation, may God have mercy on all of us. Because just like the Bible teaches, it would have been easier for all of heaven and for all of earth to pass than for one jot or for one tittle of the word thy God to fail. Thank you for listening. Good luck to all of us. And shalom. As we say here at the Windmill Ministries at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee. Good luck. And may God bless America in her endeavors towards a better, righteous way of life. God bless.